Okay, so I guess uh, we are all ready to start. My name is John Fernshaw. Um, I'm Emeritus Professor of Astronomy at the University of Canterbury. And I'd like to thank the Royal Astronomical Society, in particular, Nolani Davis, for the suggestion that I should give a couple of talks tonight. Now, I've just been to South Korea, to the second city, Busan, where the International Astronomical Union had its general assembly, actually one year later than originally planned, but COVID uh, caused a postponement. And it was a fairly unusual general assembly was, uh, where professional astronomers from all over the world come. But for the first time, this was a hybrid meeting. Normally, there are about two or 3,000 astronomers at a general assembly. In Busan, there were 1,200 in person and another 700 online. So it was the first time that a general assembly was hybrid. Now, at this general assembly, I gave a couple of talks, and I'm going to repeat those tonight. However, for the first talk, I was um, granted eight minutes, and I think um, my talk tonight will be at least double that. Have I expanded it a little bit for the local New Zealand audience? And the second talk, I had 15 minutes. It'll probably be more like half an hour. So overall, I will give two talks uh, in some total less than one hour. And after each talk, I'll be um, available to answer questions, um, which you can put into your chat session on Zoom. So let's get started. At the General Assembly, there was what's called a focus meeting. In fact, there were, I think there were 10 focus meetings, but focus meeting number two was on dark and quiet skies and how to protect the skies for astronomers, both from light pollution and satellite constellations. There were three 90-minute sessions on light pollution abatement and three 90-minute sessions on the problem of satellite constellations giving um, uh, lots of trails in astronomical images. So my talk was in the first session uh, of the three on light pollution. And in fact, it was the second talk in this focus meeting. And it's entitled Light Pollution, a unified global solution is needed for an environmental problem. So I started off by saying there are four great environmental challenges that humanity faces today. And everyone, I'm sure, is very familiar with at least three of these environmental challenges, because we hear about them nearly every day. And the first one, of course, is global warming caused by greenhouse gases, especially carbon dioxide. So I'll just mention that everyone knows that is a big environmental challenge. And then we have plastic in the oceans, including microplastics, which are ingested by fish. We eat fish, so we are actually um, consuming small plastic particles in our diets as a result of a huge amount of plastic <coughs> in the oceans. That's the second problem, which is a very well-known problem. Then we have the problem of air pollution in megacities, uh, especially from car exhausts or industrial um, smoke. And it's polluting some of the megacities, especially uh, in places like Beijing or New Delhi, where there is very poor air quality. So <clears throat> I was in Beijing um, not so long ago. And in 2012, in fact, there was a general assembly of the International Astronomical Union in Beijing. And sometimes you could hardly see the ground uh, on which you're walking. The air was so polluted. But the fourth big environmental problem is light pollution. And I would say the light pollution problem 
is far less well known compared with the other three. Astronomers certainly know about it, artificial light at night, brightening the night sky. This is what we call ALAN, artificial light at night. And although it's by far the least well known, it's least in the public eye, it's actually just as serious as the other three. And people are getting sick, people are even dying from artificial light at night at the present time. And that's why I think uh, something needs to be done about it. So, Alan, as I mentioned, is very damaging for the environment. It's bad for human health, and it's bad for astronomy because Alan brightens the night sky, and makes it harder to see the stars. And in fact, light pollution globally is known to be increasing about 2% per annum, whereas the world's population is increasing at about half that rate, 1%, and therefore, we're actually using more light per person every year as time goes on. Well, of those four environmental challenges faced by humanity, probably, even though light pollution is the least well known and least well understood, it's certainly the easiest one to solve. We just have to turn lights off and the light pollution would immediately diminish. But uh, of course, that's easier said than done. Well, the light pollution problem and its effect, adverse effect on astronomy, has been known for quite a long time. In fact, uh, about 50 years. And that's when astronomers first started worrying about light pollution. But we've known that in the 19th century, many observatories were founded in cities of Europe and North America. None of those observatories in or near cities are still used for serious observational research. And now astronomers have to build their observatories far away from city lights, generally on tops of high mountains where there's very clear air. But astronomers from the 1970s, especially people like Dave Crawford in the US and uh, Francis Graham Smith in the UK, Roger Querel in France, they started worrying about light pollution and uh, doing something about it. And certain cities in uh, Arizona, Tucson and Flagstaff, which are both important astronomical centers introduced lighting ordinances. In fact, Flagstaff as early as 1958, Tucson in 1972, and in fact, Mackenzie District uh, around Lake Tekapo, we introduced a light, lighting ordinance there with Mackenzie District Council in 1981, based on the Tucson ordinance. So astronomers have been in this fight for at least 50 years, and Dave Crawford started the International Dark Sky Association in um, the 1980s, soon after this problem was first recognized. But today there's been a huge shift in emphasis for why we should combat light pollution. And this is the crux of my talk, that it's not just astronomers who want to combat light pollution and have dark skies, but health professionals now realize that light pollution is bad for human health and environmentalists realize that it's bad for the environment. In fact, just about every species of plant and animal is adversely affected in one way or another by too much light at night. And therefore, in the last 20 years, I think there's been a huge difference in how we approach this problem. And it's not a fight just by astronomers. And of course, the number of people who want to actually see the stars is quite limited. Astronomers, astro-tourists, only a tiny fraction of the world's population are bothered about seeing the stars, regrettably. But I think everyone is interested in human health and probably a majority of people, especially in this country, 
are interested in the environmental issues that arise from light pollution. Therefore, since about the turn of the century, the whole game has really changed. Now, we had a Starlight Conference at Tekapo in October 2019, where many of these uh, human health and environmental issues were discussed. And we drew up a plan that we should have aimed to have a dark sky nation. And Melanie Davis and Gareth Davis and Steve Butler all joined this dark sky nation campaign and the aim, I think, was to have as many communities in dark sky places recognized with accreditation from the IDA. But I think the issue is now much wider because, for example, the environmental issues, light pollution at night is very bad for nocturnal species such as Mopok, Ruru, and uh, Kiwi, and so on. And therefore, I think we need to um, think about the environmental impact. And that's not in dark sky places with very few people and who, uh, where you want to go see the stars. But um, I think the environmental impact is probably in small towns or on the edge of our major cities, at least in this country. And that's where you have a lot of streetlights and a lot of wildlife mixed together. And also parks and trees, which are also, the trees are adversely affected by too much light at night. So if you want to tackle the environmental issue, just creating more dark sky places with IDA accreditation, places like Ayuraki Mackenzie or Great Barrier Island, that's fine, but it's not nearly enough if we're serious about reducing the environmental impact of light pollution. And then let's look at uh, the human health impact. We know that light pollution disrupts our hormone production, especially melatonin, which is a hormone controlling our sleep patterns, circadian rhythm. Melatonin is only released into our bloodstream from the pineal gland if we are sleeping at night in the absence of light, especially blue light. Everyone wants to have good health, but of course this issue of light pollution causing poor health is really an issue in our cities, not in dark sky places like um, Lake Tekapo or Great Barrier Island. And therefore, I think it's a much wider problem. We need far more than just having more dark sky places in this country. And that applies in other countries as well. Let's look at what light pollution can look like. This is actually in the UK um, at Eastbourne. It used to be near the site of the Royal Greenwich Observatory at Hurstmonster, which moved its telescopes to the Canary Islands uh, a few decades ago, because clearly places like Eastbourne and Brighton nearby cause a lot of light pollution. We can measure the brightness of the night sky in SI units or in magnitudes per square arc second. We know that a completely dark sky has about 22 visual magnitudes per square arc second, or in SI units, it's about 250 microcandela per square meter, which is a measure of the surface brightness of the night sky. That's the natural air glow without any light pollution. And astronomers in the 1970s said that if the brightness of the night sky is 10% more than the naturally occurring air glow, that's not good news for astronomy. So at least near astronomical observatories, you shouldn't have more than 10% greater than the 250 microcandela per square meter. Well, there is light pollution uh, over Eastbourne. 
where um, it's several times the natural airglow, probably 10 times at least. And here, closer to home, is a picture of light pollution in Dunedin. First of all, in um, 2016, uh, on the left, with mainly sodium lights, largely unshielded. And then central Dunedin has changed over to light emitting diodes, blue rich light emitting diodes. So there is the same view of the city in 2021. And these uh, light emitting diodes emit a lot of blue light. And unfortunately, just measuring the night sky brightness in mag visual magnitudes per square arc second, or in micro candela per square meter, doesn't record the blue light because the candela or the visual magnitude is measuring in the yellow to which our eyes are during the day sensitive. So um, probably the problem is far worse than just measuring uh, the night sky brightness in these standard units um, is revealing. So most light pollution probably comes from street lights, and we can ask the question, who actually controls the amount of artificial light at night from street lights? And the answer is clearly, in most, certainly in New Zealand and most countries, it's controlled at local government level. In New Zealand, the transport agency controls lighting on the state highways, but at city councils or, or districts that control the lighting in most side streets, especially in residential areas. But unfortunately, if we're going to tackle the human health problem in our towns and cities, I can say that local government is not well equipped to deal with this problem because Lighting is a highly technical matter, and the technology is changing quite rapidly. And it's unrealistic to expect every local government council to keep up with that te technology. Even in New Zealand, there are almost 60 councils. Are we going to train all of them in the uh, technology of required? for good lighting. It would be much better if we could have some national policy so that everyone is not reinventing the wheel. And at present in New Zealand and indeed throughout the world, most countries are doing it in a piecemeal fashion. And there must be hundreds or even thousands of local government councils throughout the world are we expecting each one to introduce its own legislation to control the human health problem and the environmental problem in or near cities? That seems to me to be totally unrealistic, especially with the rapidly changing technology which these councils have to keep up with. And we've already been um, familiar in Mackenzie District where um, Steve Butler and I have been trying to educate the council to introduce a new lighting ordinance in their district plan. And it's proving to be quite a lot of hard work. And I know other people have been talking to Kaikoura District Council because they want to have accreditation from IDA as an International Dark Sky Reserve. And it seems to me we're wasting a lot of time and effort trying to reinvent the same advice uh, in all these different councils. And this is true for New Zealand. I'm sure it's true internationally as well. So that's why I think we need national controls and national controls would be imposed by law, but they would in turn be based on agreed international guidelines there's no reason every country should have to introduce the same principles of good lighting in, for their streetlights. 
So that's what I think we need, national controls with which are imposed by law and agreed international guidelines. Just to give people some idea, everyone is installing LED streetlights, light emitting diodes, because certainly they produce more light for less electricity, they're more um, efficient. The first LED streetlights were introduced about 2006, and generally we think they will last several decades before they fail and have to be replaced. No one's absolutely sure because we've only had LED street, street lights for one and a half decades or a bit, bit longer. And the first ones that came in 2006 had this enormous strong blue peak if we look at the spectral power distribution or SPD. And so the first ones were blue rich and the amount of blue lights can be specified by the correlated color temperature, sometimes written CCT, and the correlated um, color temperature of the first LED streetlights was about 5,000 Kelvin. So that top left image shows uh, one of these early LEDs, and they're very unpleasant to look at because they have a very harsh uh, blue color, intense white. However, new technology called the phosphor converted amber LED takes a lot of that blue light and converts it into yellow or visual light. And phosphor converted LEDs therefore have a much lower correlated color, color temperature. And the top right hand SPD, spectral power distribution, shows a phosphor converted amber LED, which um, from the company Maxibel in, in this case, but there are many companies producing these PC amber LEDs, where the blue peak has been greatly diminished. Now it's blue light, which disrupts our hormones the most, and it's blue light, which scatters in the atmosphere. So it's blue light, which is uh, the most harmful, both for human beings and the environment and for astronomy. Therefore, these phosphor converted amber LEDs are certainly much better. But there is a new technology again, still the LEDs, uh, the narrowband amber LED, where the distribution of light is really restricted to a really narrow band around 580 or 590 about the same color as, in fact, the um, low-pressure sodium lights with essentially no blue light at all. I'm not sure if these are commercially available in large quantities. The technology certainly, however, exists. And in the future, we can hope that this narrowband amber LED will become uh, more normally used. Unfortunately, the color rendering capabilities of these almost monochromatic lights is not very good. And some people like to be able to perceive different colors at night. Anyway, so that tells you something about the evolving LED technology. And I think it's a hard ask to expect every council throughout this country or indeed the world to keep up with what's happening in the fast changing lighting technology of LEDs. That's why it's much better to have national or international guidelines about what should be done. Well, some countries have indeed introduced national laws. And the most outstanding example of that is France. And in France, there was a decree of the 27th of December, 2018, uh, on the prevention, reduction, and limitation of light pollution it came into force January 2019. Croatia also introduced national lighting controls about the same time, updating earlier laws of 2011 and 2015. So what I say is that all countries need to follow these leads and introduce similar legislation. What I would like is New Zealand to have national legislation because um, having, say, a dozen dark sky places with uh, 
just a few councils well away from <coughs> major centres of population is not nearly enough if we are to solve the environmental and human health issues. CIE is the International Commission for Illumination. They issue technical port reports with recommendations on outdoor lighting. <coughs> and that's fine. CIE has, however, only 37 member countries, including New Zealand. So their reports are not widely distributed. And if you want to read them, you have to go to your library or pay for them. And therefore, most countries are not really aware of what CIE is recommending for good lighting. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's look at what the French decree um, of the 27th December 2018, which came into force on the 1st of January 2019. There are two parts to this French law. One applies to all public and private outdoor lighting, not just street lighting, but um, private commercial businesses and residential homes. Anything that puts light outside comes in under the force of this law anywhere in France. Part two of the French law applies just to 11 astronomical observatories. And there's some, still some very important observatories on the French mainland. <coughs> One is Pic du Midi in the Pyrenees and Observatoire Haute Provence in Provence, of course. They're the two major ones, but there are quite a number of provincial observatories in France as well. Observatoire de Côte d'Azur is another one on the Mediterranean coast. So the law takes into account the adverse effect of artificial light at night on flora, on fauna, human health, energy waste, and observing the night sky. Sorry, I missed, misspelled night there. And what it um, covers is flood lighting of building. Buildings should be curtailed, not completely banned, but greatly reduced <coughs> and subject to a curfew. The upward light ratio says that no more than 1% of any outdoor light should go upwards into the sky, which of course is wasted light. Light is only useful if it's shining down, illuminating a scene, usually on the ground. There's, there are strict rules against the reduction of glare, which is light shining straight into our faces. There's a reduction of blue light, 3,000 Kelvin is the color temperature in towns for the LEDs, but in rural settings between 2,400 and 2,700 Kelvin, which have much less blue light. At 3,000 Kelvin, about 30% of the light is still below 500 nanometers, in other words, in the blue region. At 2,400, it's probably about 15%. Light trespass is totally banned. That's light shining into people's uh, windows. And searchlights and lasers are banned, or at least they're strictly controlled and very much curtailed. In the towns and cities, uh, 35 lux is permitted for street lighting. That's the amount of light uh, lumens per square meter shining down onto the ground. But in rural areas, it's down to 10 lux. So those are the main provisions of the French law, and I'd very much like New Zealand to adopt a similar law, and indeed all countries, and that would take an enormous burden off local government. So which global organizations are combating artificial light at night at present? IUCN has a dark skies advisory group, and they've just um, written a report on the effect of um, light, artificial light at night on the environment. And this should come out, it's still not been published, but it should come out quite soon. And IUCN publishes a list of all the dark sky places recognized by IDA and the Starlight Foundation. But these dark sky places, such as Iraqi Mackenzie, Great Barrier Island, uh, Stewart Island, um, they cover just 0.14% of the Earth's land area, mainly where people are not living. So clearly this is not going to have 
these places are not going to have a lot of effect on human health or environmental concerns uh, caused by streetlights. IDA is very active, the International Dark Sky Association, in combating light pollution, but it's mainly interested in these dark sky places for astronomers and stargazers. And the Starlight Foundation in Spain does much the same sort of work as IDA. It recognizes uh, starlight reserves. The International Astronomical Union has two committees for tackling this issue. One's called Commission B7, and the other is the Executive Committee Working Group. And um, this focus meeting where I spoke was part of the um, Executive Committee Working Group of the IAU. Then there's the Globe at Night, which is a big citizen science project getting people to, around the world to measure um, the brightness of the night sky. And hundreds of thousands of uh, measurements have been done in about 180 countries of the brightness of the night sky as part of the global Globe at Night citizen science campaign, which became very prominent in uh, 2009, the International Year of Astronomy. Then there are two other organizations, the Illumination Engineering Society, IES, and the Global Lighting Alliance. They're both lighting associations. They certainly try and promote good lighting, but generally their philosophy is to promote more light, not less, less light. So I think Alan is a bit of a conflict of interest. I don't think they are the right bodies to help us solve the global light pollution problem. So what are the right international organizations to promote global lighting guidelines? I think none of the existing organizations has the power or the authority to influence national governments on Allen. What we need is a strong top-down approach, international guidelines and national legislation, and not the present bottom-up piecemeal lobbying of local government for lighting controls. So what international bodies would promote these guidelines? One obvious one is UNESCO. Now, UNESCO has always said they're not interested in controlling the brightness of the night sky because no one owns the night sky. But if we tell UNESCO this is a human health problem or an environmental problem, I think there's a better chance that they will listen. The International Science Council used to be called ICSU. Its members are about 200 international scientific unions, including the International Astronomical Union, plus over 60 national science academies, including the Royal Society of New Zealand. So this body, the president is actually a New Zealander, Sir Peter Gluckman. This body, I think, is very influential in influencing uh, the national academies, which in turn can influence the governments to which they belong. So I actually sent an email to Sir Peter Gluckman, president of ISC, and he said he was interesting, interested in having a, a some kind of um, deposition, some kind of uh, statement uh, from the IAU about how this uh, global problem can be tackled. Now we know that blue light at night is a health issue. The American Medical Association pointed out that uh, blue light affects, uh, disrupts human hormones. They issued reports in 2012 and 2016, 2016 especially being on the problem of light emitting diodes. Then the OECD is um, the organization with 38 member countries in the developed Western world, including New Zealand. They have an environment directorate and they meet in Paris, this environment directorate, once or twice a year. And I think they could also have a lot of influence because many of the worst polluters for light pollution are also OECD members. So I think those four organizations are the ones which should be uh, targeted to issue guidelines. Then we need to engage and lobby with the resources of the IAU, 
IDA, IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, Starlight Foundation, all of those are already committed to fighting Alan. But I think the first four have far more influence and grunt with the national governments. So I'd like to see them um, promoting the fight against light pollution. Well, that's all I have to say on this problem. There was a fairly low key talk, I might say, at the IAU General Assembly in South Korea. But um, I'm quite passionate about this issue. And I think we need to change focus from this piecemeal local government approach to an international or at least a national government approach and try and have national legislation following the example of France and Croatia, which already have introduced these national laws. So um, I'm now open to any questions. We put questions in chat. And Steve Henley, you can tell me, are there any questions in chat? Uh, yes, there are a couple, John. Um, first of all, Eric um, says, interesting that France is so much ahead of everyone else, it seems. Is there any record of how the public and French organisations have responded to the new law, especially as regards the cost aspect? I don't have that information. Um, I certainly think the French are streaks ahead of most other countries in introducing a national law which applies to everyone. And um, how it is actually received in France and whether a lot of commercial companies started squealing. But I think uh, it's not actually, um, light pollution is not now just from street lights, it's primarily street lighting, but in many countries we see these illuminated billboards popping up, even in Christchurch there are some, and they, uh, a real problem because it's very hard to shield uh, a billboard in a vertical plane from light going up into the sky. And they are a distraction to drivers. They're a human health hazard and a safety hazard. And, and they pollute as well. So I don't know what the French have done about uh, that, how the law was received. I need to do, ask them and my French friends and see what, what they think about it. So, sorry, I can't really answer that person's question. The law is very recent in France, I might say. It was 2019. So perhaps there's more um, water to flow under the bridge and more people have ideas. But generally, it's regarded as a very progressive law. But um, let's see. What's the next question? Thanks, John. There's just one more question. Um, and that is, what decision was made by the IAU in this regard following your talk? Well, what I didn't mention is that not so much as a result of my talk, which I think was quite well received, but the IAU, together with the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, organized two conferences with very extensive reports in 2020 and 2021. And these were dark and quiet skies for science and society. And these reports cover both artificial light at night and the satellite constellation problem for astronomy. And as a result, the IAU has set up a center for combating satellite constellations. The IAU is certainly very keen to combat um, artificial light at night as well, because it has such an adverse impact on observatories. By the way, the image you're looking at now is Kitt Peak National Observatory, just out of Tucson in Arizona. And you can see the um, sky glow from Phoenix, which probably is about 200 kilometers away, and in another direction from Tucson, which is, I guess, about 50 kilometers away. So there are actually two light domes at Kitt Peak. So this is the story of 
for many of the world's main observatories. And now there are probably about half a dozen really good sites for astronomy left in the world. Uh, Kitt Peak's not one of them. Um, Canary Islands, Mauna Kea in Hawaii, uh, several mountain tops in the Chilean Andes, Andes, where there are about half a dozen major international observatories. And the other places are in Uzbekistan, um, in um, Tibet, and northern India in um, Kashmir. So those are the places in the Himalayas and the, the Pamir ranges, which are still good for astronomy. But really, the top rated sites, completely free of light pollution, are now half a dozen or so worldwide. Uh, just one what final question. question. Yes. Um, so what are the next steps for New Zealand beyond just talks amongst astronomers and environmentalists? Well, after our Starlight Conference in 2019, uh, Steve Butler, Melani and Gareth Davies set up the Dark Sky Network and the focus was helping Dark Sky communities get IDA accreditation. And I think that work is very important. It must go on, but it's mainly to help astronomers and stargazers and astro tourists. I would like to see a shift in focus and try and have national legislation following the example of France. And I think we've got to lob lobby Ministry for the Environment, perhaps Ministry for Health and um, DOC and see if we can get them interested in national legislation. So I'd say a slightly different approach is needed if we are serious about tackling environmental and health issues arising from light pollution, especially blue light. So that may be a task for Rasmus Dark Skies Group, which Steve Butler chairs. And I'd like to think we could tackle this by uh, lobbying our MPs and writing to ministers of some of those key ministries. And we just had one more question come in um, before we move on to the next part. And that's from Malcolm who wants to know, do you see there being the political will here to take the steps you suggest, especially considering issues with centralizing water and infrastructure, for example, away from local councils? I actually don't know because we haven't uh, done the test yet to see what the response would be. But I think um, there is um, probably enough interest in uh, light pollution and the damage it's doing to human health and the environment. After all, New Zealand is a very environmentally conscious country and everyone is interested in good health and people just don't realise how bad blue light at night is for uh, human health because of the way it disrupts uh, hormone production. I, I don't want to give you an impression that blue light is always bad for your health. It's only blue light at night. Blue light in the morning when the sun rises is actually very good because it produces another hormone, serotonin, which is um, important for alertness and um, feeling happy and being pleasure. So blue light has to be at the right times of the circadian rhythm. And let's see what the appetite is. But if we promote the story about um, human health and <coughs> how just about all species are adversely affected by artificial light at night, then I think um, probably I hope politicians will start listening. It'll be a fairly hard slog. Nothing's going to happen this year or next. It might take five years before we have um, a government that is really listening. But yes, I, I'm quite optimistic it's possible. Yeah, Should we go on to the, the next question? On this part, yes. So I'm going to 
get rid of that PowerPoint and bring up the next one. Now, I'm going to be talking in this talk um, about the IAU Working Group for Professional Amateur Relations in Astronomy. Uh, for short, we call it the Pro-Am Working Group. And this working group is to promote relations between the IAU, which is an organization for about 12,500 professional astronomers, and to get these professional astronomers, the IAU, IAU members, to start engaging with a much larger body of amateurs around the world, because there's a huge resource and, uh, in, and expertise in this amateur community. So the IAU was actually founded um, more than 100 years ago, in 1919, in fact. And certainly for 50 years, it completely ignored amateur astronomers. It was really a closed society for professionals only. And <clears throat> the professional astronomers for 50 years were really just talking about how to classify stars and what stars to be standard stars and how to measure the brightness of stars. And it was something, uh, a very esoteric sort of discussion for the professionals only. And they really did ignore amateur astronomers. Well, I thought this was not a good idea. So I actually sent a memo to the executive committee of the IAU in 2019 at that time, I was part of the executive committee, so I knew what they were thinking. And I said, we should start an executive committee, EC, Pro-Am Working Group. And I thought it would be a good idea if amateur societies like Rasmus, for example, could affiliate with the IAU. And I thought it was a good idea if we could have an IAU symposium, well, every year, the IAU organizes about nine symposia on different topics of interest to um, professional astronomers, mainly um, astronomical research. But I thought it would be a good idea to have an IAU symposium on promoting pro-am relations. So that was the essence of my memo of May 2019. In this memo, I identified three rather poorly defined groups of amateurs. And I say poorly defined, the boundaries between these three different groups of amateur astronomers is uh, a bit fuzzy. But group one were amateurs able to carry out significant research. And I've observed some extraordinarily talented amateurs in this country, in New Zealand, who are doing research at their private observatories and doing it very successfully. I won't mention any names, but I know there are probably at least a dozen people in this country, probably more, able to do significant research with small telescopes. Then there's another larger group of amateurs, still with small telescopes, who enjoy looking at the sky. They're not pretending to do research, but they're inspired by the beauty of the night sky they enjoy looking at all the different uh, objects which you can see through a small telescope or record uh, with a CCD camera working through a small telescope. And this group of amateurs uh, love observing and they enjoy the beauty of the night sky. Then there's a third group of amateurs, which is probably the largest group. Perhaps they don't have their own telescopes, but they enjoy reading about astronomy. They read popular books and they read magazine articles like Sky and Telescope or Southern Stars, the Resonance Journal, or Astronomy or Astronomy Now. They're excellent magazines bringing people up to date with what's happening in the world of uh, astronomy. So broadly, those are the three categories 
of amateur, which my memo identified. Well, group one are the smallest, but um, I think they're perhaps the most important as they can contribute to research. Well, there are some countries in the world with quite a lot of amateur astronomers and New Zealand is one of them. But a few years ago, I went to Iran. I was astonished to find there are about 30,000 uh, amateur astronomers in Iran and many of them uh, very competent astronomers. And they're based in about 200 different um, amateur astronomy associations in that country. So countries like Iran, New Zealand, and I'm sure quite a few others, about one person in two and a half thousand of the total population is an amateur astronomer in one of those three categories. So how many amateur astronomers are there in the world? Well, no one really knows, but if you can make a list of all the amateur societies or associations and add up their membership, there's almost certainly well over a million in groups one, two, and three together. Well, the International Astronomical Union, the IAU, has about 12,000 members. So it seems that the ratio of amateurs to professionals is at least 100 to 1. Of course, um, those amateurs in Group 1, I'm really not sure how many there are, it might only be 2% of these uh, million plus amateurs worldwide. And Group 2, who knows, people with their own telescopes or private observatories, maybe 25%. But still, 25% of more than a million people, still a lot of people. And then the largest group, group three, are the rest. So, um, beginning of this year, there were 12,101 members of the IAU. That number jumped at the General Assembly to about 12,500. Uh, every year, more people join. And so the ratio of amateurs to professionals, professionals being IAU members, is of the order of 100 to 1, two orders of magnitude greater. And that's why I think the IAU can no longer go on ignoring this very large body of amateurs worldwide. In fact, the IAU has had two strategic plans now, that for 2010 to 20, and the second strategic plan, 2020 to 30, and as a result of those strategic plans that the Office of Astronomy for Development was established in Cape Town in 2011, and the Office for Astronomy Outreach was established in Tokyo in 2012, both with small body of professional staff manning those offices, and those the strategic, strategic plan 2020 to 30, the one currently in force, resolved to connect professional and amateur astronomers. So um, really for the first time, the IU is making big strides to do just that and to engage with the amateur community worldwide. Well, OAO, the Office for Astronomy Outreach, um, is based at the Japanese National Astronomical Observatory of Japan, just out on the outskirts of Tokyo. And they have a memorandum of understanding between the IAU and NAOJ, National Astronomical Observatory of Japan, on what OAO, OAO should be doing. Well, OAO has established national outreach coordinators, some, sometimes called NOCs, in many countries of the world, including New Zealand. And the NOCs are responsible for maintaining the relationship with the national communities of amateur astronomers, astronomers and science outreach professionals. So through OAO, a real difference is happening. As I mentioned, I was on the executive committee as an IAU vice president until August last year. And that's where I introduced this memo which was approved eventually in April 2021. And thanks to Evine uh, 
and Disserk, who was then president of the IAU, as she is on the right. And thanks to the support of the present president, who was at the time president-elect, that's uh, Deborah Elmagreen from the USA, those two uh, IAU presidents uh, both gave fantastic support to this idea of a EC working group for professional amateur relations. So that's when this working group was born in April last year. And the first thing we did was set up an organizing committee for the working group. And we invited 13 people in different countries around the world, um, many of them developing countries with strong amateur communities. So myself in New Zealand and Aniket Sule in India became the co-chairs jointly of this working group. Lena Canast, who is the director of OAO, she's Portuguese, but as I say, she works uh, just out of Tokyo. Uh, she is also part of the organizing committee. Beatriz Garcia in Argentina. Stella Kafka was director of the American Association for Variable Star Observers in the US, but she resigned and she left AAVSO end of last year. Yuko Kakazu, she's Japanese, but she works in Hawaii at the Subaru Telescope. She is secretary of the working group. Moen Mosley in Iran, I met him when I was visiting um, Tehran. He is now at the University of Shiraz in southern Iran. Mijana Povic uh, is Serbian, but works in Ethiopia. She resigned in the end of last year. Kaz Sekiguchi, very well-known astronomer in Japan. Boon Laraksar Sunthorn Tam in Thailand. He was my student in the 1980s, director of NARIT, the Thai National Astronomy Research Institute. He's just retired, but he's still very active indeed. Aniket, I've mentioned, he's in Bombay, Mumbai. Tim Spuck in the USA, um, he became co-chair this month and I stepped down as co-chair because I thought I'm getting a bit old for this job and I wanted younger people. So now Aniket and Tim are the co-chairs. Ilya Uzoskin in Finland, he is a vice president of the IAU and he liaises with the EC, keeps in touch. Antonio Varela in the Canary Islands in Spain is also on the OC. Well, two people stepped down and they were replaced by Myra Lebron in Puerto Rico and Clementina Sasso in Italy. You should note that these people are very widely distributed around the world, not concentrated in just uh, North America or Western Europe, though they, there are members there. And of the 13 current members, six are female, five are male. So there's actually um, more women than men. And the IU is very keen to maintain gender balance, as well as a geographical wide distribution. And here you can see where these people come from. Those in brackets are the two who step down. And you can see we have a very wide distribution. I just put the initials of the people on our organizing committee. And I think one of our strengths is we're widely distributed in countries very often which with large amateur communities, especially India, Iran, New Zealand, and the United States. So the organizing committee had a um, Zoom meeting and we decided um, we needed a database of amateur societies or associations in many countries of the world. And to do that, we conducted the survey of amateur astronomy, astronomy societies um, and of um, amateur astronomers. And that survey enabled us to form the database of contacts. And one, one of our first aims was we should try and promote research collaborations, especially between the amateurs and group one, those research capable amateurs. And these would be collaborations with IAU professional members. 
<coughs> the IEU had an in-person workshop in Brussels to celebrate its centenary, and this was very successful. That was as April 2019. We thought we should continue these workshops, probably one day workshops, possibly they could be virtual or hybrid, virtual and um, in-person, that is, um, for amateur and professional astronomers, especially to give the amateurs a chance to, prevent, to present their um, research activities. OAO, the Office for Astronomy Outreach, has a program called Meet the IAU Astronomers. As I say, there are 12,500 IAU astronomers, professional astronomers. Many of them are interested in giving talks to amateur societies. An amateur society anywhere in the world only has to contact the OAO, Lena Kanes, in Tokyo, and they can recommend an IAU member, perhaps in their country, and perhaps on some specific area of astronomical expertise to give a talk, either in person or over Zoom uh, to these amateur societies. So there's a huge resource uh, where professional astronomers can now give talks to amateurs. And then we thought the idea of an IEU symposium, that's a five-day conference devoted to program relations, was a good one. So we conducted this survey um, between December last year and February this year. We had nearly 2,000 replies from individual amateur astronomers, 367 amateur astronomy organizations, including Rasmus, by the way, uh, responded to this survey. And we also invited professional astronomers, that is IEU members, to respond, and over 500 did so. We asked them a whole range of questions, but this idea of research collaborations was extremely well received. 80% were extremely or very interested in research collaborations of these nearly 2,000 amateurs. And they're also very interested in having a one-day workshop, 94% moderately very or extremely interested uh, in having a one-day workshop. Well, there were a whole range of questions, but the enthusiasm for those two aspects was certainly uh, noted. And that's encouraged us to go ahead with um, promoting these ideas. So what kind of research uh, could be done collaboratively? Well, traditionally in group one, the research capable amateurs, variable star photometry, and in some cases now, even spectroscopy has become uh, the mainstay of amateur astronomy. Um, I know in New Zealand there's a very active uh, group um, doing um, occultations of stars by asteroids to find the dimensions of asteroids. Supernova searches, uh, amateurs can still play a role in that, extragalactic supernovae, that is. Light curves of galactic novae, New Zealand is well placed for that because. A lot of galactic novae are in Sagittarius in the direction of the galactic center, and it's at southern declinations. Microlensing, well, there are quite a few very dedicated amateurs in this country and around the world doing precise photometry of microlens stars, and this is one way of discovering exoplanets. Astrometry of asteroids and minor planets, uh, amateurs can play an important role there. And I've listed their observations of aurorae, but one outcome of my talk was maybe that's not a great way because you don't want to be swamped with um, lots and lots of pretty pictures of aurorae. Um, it has to be research where amateurs can um, contribute. So perhaps aurorae should not be on the list. So what we're going to do very soon is establish a website that would be linked to the IAU um, Pro-Am Working Group website. So it's www.iau.org. And on that website, you can go to the um, webpage of the Pro-Am Working Group. And that website will soon have a link to 
where amateurs can register their interest to collaborate and IU professionals can register their research projects where they want amateurs to collaborate. So um, that should go live, I would say, in the next month at uh, the ProAm Working Group website. I'll give you the link uh, very soon. I mentioned that uh, three years ago, there was this in-person workshop in Brussels, part of the IAU centenary celebrations, very successful. <clears throat> so the ProAm Working Group wants to organize further workshops like that and um, probably every two years. And we're talking about April next year, possibly in India, there will be Aniket Suli will organize a workshop uh, for amateurs and professionals to discuss their joint research projects. So that will be announced uh, also fairly soon. The Meet the Astronomers scheme has been running for some time, uh, for a few years now, but uh, the pandemic uh, has curtailed its activities. So in 2021 to 22, there were 38 requests from amateur organizations for talks by professional astronomers. And 23 of those, the 38 requests, 23 talks were delivered, but they were delivered virtually. Hopefully the program can now greatly expand as the pandemic dies down and there will be many more in-person talks. So um, amateur associations anywhere in the world can contact OAO and request uh, an IEU astronomer either in the vicinity geographically or on some particular topic to speak from anywhere in the world virtually. So that can now go ahead in greatly expanded form. But a full day, uh, full five day, uh, full week conference on Pro-Am relations. I proposed such a conference to the IU Executive Committee in 2017 with Moen Mosley in Iran and the IU Executive Committee in its uh, um, hindsight didn't approve that proposal to have a symposium in October 2017 in Iran. The IEU has never had a symposium in Iran, so I think in hindsight it's a big missed opportunity. But we should try again and have a five day symposium on pro am relations. Iran would still be great, provided um, the sanctions finish in that country or India. Um, would also be a good host location. As I mentioned, the Pro-Am Working Group has 13 members around the world. But we've also introduced what we call working group members at large. And these can be anyone interested in amateur astronomy, um, either IAU members or amateur astronomers. And if you're interested in becoming a working group member at large, it just means we will keep you in touch with what is happening and tell you about our activities. So far, about three dozen people have become members at large. And if you want to become a member at large of our working group, just email Aniket Suli in Mumbai. And his email address is very simple, aniket.suli at gmail.com. So the IAU Pro-Am Working Group has a website, it's part of the IAU um, website. So it's www.iau.org. Either go there or follow that complete URL or go to iau.org, follow science, scientific bodies, working groups, and you'll end up at the Pro-Am Working Group. And we hope to have a page on establishing these um, professional amateur research collaborations live uh, probably within a month on that um, Pro-Am Working Group website. So that's all I wanted to say about professional amateur relations in astronomy. I think it's an important new activity for the IAU. And just at the bottom of my um, final slide, I'm promoting the Aotearoa Astro Tourism Academy, 
which is an organization I started uh, last year with Nalani Davies. And we are giving courses for any amateur astronomer who is interested in learning the basics or for astrotourism night sky guides who need to know the basics of astronomy in order to talk with confidence to astro tourists. <clears throat> and our next course um, is going to be in Auckland um, over the weekend, 21 to 23 October. So if you're interested, please uh, enroll, go to um, aanz.org and find out about the Aotearoa Astrotourism Academy. Thank you so much. So Steve, any questions? <coughs> Yes, certainly there are. And Gareth, I'm extremely aware, thanks to your fantastic promotion of Unistellar EV scopes, and that's a great way for amateurs to have fun. Whether it's a way for amateurs to do research, I'm not sure, but yep, supernova searches could be done. You could target distant galaxies um, and look for supernovae with those EV scopes. Well, as I say, New Zealand has some extraordinarily able amateurs already doing research and collaborating with um, groups around the world and with IEU members, that is. And um, well, obviously, they should continue doing that great work, but um, it may well be that amateurs who have the facilities who are not yet really collaborating in um, top flight research programs could be encouraged to um, register on our website when it goes live. And perhaps uh, an IU professional project lead, professional astronomer who is a project leader, and these projects uh, will also be registered. So I think. Rasmus can promote the scheme by encouraging um, amateurs with telescopes to become research active and actually do some collaborative research with IEU members. So the website's going to work a little bit like um, a dating website, bringing parties together, not actually um, negotiating with either party, but you'll be able to see which. IAU project leaders would um, are requesting help from amateurs. And for example, um, people observing stars might want amateurs spread around the world at different longitudes to intensively monitor the uh, a star photometric photometrically or even spectroscopically. Um, at different longitudes, so um, you can have 24-hour coverage. So that's the sort of um, uh, program on variable stars, which I think many amateurs can take part in. So uh, Rasmus can sim simply encourage their members to look out for this website when it goes live, and hopefully some Rasmus members will start participating in, re in research. So, Thanks, John. More we've got, yeah, we've got um, a comment from Andrew who said, it's worth noting that many amateurs are published scientists and engineers in their own fields, and astronomy is just a step to the right. I absolutely agree. And um, some of the most competent amateurs are professional engineers, and they've made their telescopes, and they've, they're very good at um, computers and IT and data reduction. So... 
their professional careers uh, have set them up well to engage in astronomy as a hobby. And they, these, these are some of the people, not the only ones, who um, certainly are or could be in my, what I call group one, the research capable amateurs. So that's certainly very true. And then possibly finally, Ewan um, comments, uh, do you think your two talks are related? Because with darker suburban skies, we'd have more amateurs doing research. <laughs> they weren't intended to be related. They're both quite low-key talks amongst many very high-powered talks from Nobel laureates and others at the IAU General Assembly. So no, they're not particularly related. But it's certainly true that for amateurs to flourish doing research, very often they have to work under slightly polluted skies because they're working in towns or cities like Auckland, Wellington, Christchurch, and they do have to contend with light pollution. So I suppose there is a link there that amateurs have an interest in combating light pollution as well as professionals do. Thank you very much, John. Uh, that looks like that's it for the questions. Great. Great. Okay, so I've gone a little bit over one hour, so probably that's a good time to stop. So we say...